Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Psalms in the Bible. And this is lesson number four in that series for January 27 of 2024, entitled, The Lord Hears and Delivers. Last week, we talked about God being a creator, a king, a judge, a covenant maker, and so forth. Now we're going to talk about God hearing and delivering. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, how thankful we need to be because you hear and deliver. Um, sometimes it seems impossible that you could be throughout the entire universe present and hear every single one of us and understand our needs. Not only our verbal things that we say out loud, but even our thoughts. Amazing. But now we're going to see more clearly from this study about how you hear and deliver. Guide us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone who has read Psalms more than a few times recognizes there are many calls by the psalmist for God's help. Why do you think that is? Probably because they weren't following. Well, that's part of it. Well, because he was expressing his true emotions. God, yeah. I need help. Yeah, very much so. Suppose that you were like David and tomorrow you're out there with your sword. You don't even know if you're going to come home that night. There are also many promises of God's deliverance. We have already studied several verses that tell us that God is our creator and sustainer. These verses appear not only in the Old Testament, verses suggesting that, but in Psalms, also in the New Testament. Our God is a personal God who cares about every one of us. That includes you. This might produce some questions. How could God be close to us people, his people, and yet be living on the other side of the universe somewhere in heaven? Jim? Well, the Bible study guide. God is close to his people and in his creation, both in heaven and earth. Though he has established his throne, excuse me, his throne in heaven and rides on the clouds, he also is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. The Psalms unswervingly uphold the truth that the Lord is the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. The Psalms are meaningful precisely because they are prompted by and are addressed to the living God who hears and answers prayer from the Bible study guide. Okay, and then the verses to support that idea. Dwayne? Yet I always stay close to you and you hold me by the hand. You guide me with your instruction and at the end you will receive me with honor. What else have I in heaven but you? Since I have you, what else could I want on earth? <laughs> quite, a, quite a comment, huh? I mean, if I have you, what else do I need, right? If we know that God is constantly with us and aware of everything that we think and do, how should that impact our behavior and our thinking? How does the nearness of God and his attention to every detail of our lives impact us? Impact how we live? Are we fully aware that both good and evil angels are constantly beside us? Is there a way to chase the evil angels away? Yeah. Can we crowd them out? Well, we could we can we can limit their access to our brains. I don't know if we can crowd them out completely, but that's a good question, a fair question. Well, these are few, there are few psalms that give more details about God's individual care for us than Psalm 139. Okay. Psalms 139 from the Good News Bible. Lord, We're, you, we're just going to read the few verses. It's a long one. Go ahead. You're going to have to tell me which ones to skip. No, no. I, I, I'm just, I only gave you the first 18 verses. Yeah. Okay. Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You know everything I do. 
From far away you understand all my thoughts. You see me, whether I am working or resting. You know all my actions. Even before I speak, you already know what I will say. Verse, jumping to verse 7. Where could I go to escape from you? Where could I get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there. If I flew away beyond the east or lived in the furthest place in the west, you would be there to lead me and you would be there to help me. I could ask the darkness to hide me or the light round me to turn into night. But even darkness is not dark for you. And the night is as bright as the day. <laughs> darkness and light are the same to you. You created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. Sounds like a pro-choice uh, verse there. Yes. When my, boi when my boi bones are being form were being formed carefully, you put together in my mother's womb. When I was growing there in secret, you knew I was there. You saw me before I was born. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. I, oh God, how difficult I find your thoughts, how many of them there are. If I counted them, there would be more than the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Good News Bible. Wow. Are, or should we, are you comfortable with the idea that God knows everything? Well, it's a reality whether we're comfortable with it or not. Yeah. Have you ever had the experience of wanting to do something for someone, but you could not for whatever reason? Have you ever been in an experience where you wish that someone could do something for you, but for whatever reason they could not? David recognized that God was near and knew everything about him, even when he was still in his mother's womb. Do we have any idea what age David was when he did the bulk of his, the Psalms? We know that he was, he was writing Psalms while he was still a, a teenager. teenager. So it's, it's really quite remarkable, is yeah, it not? Really, it is. That, that, uh, so, I mean, some of them, some of the really very mature. Yes. Must have had good teachers. <laughs> yeah. His father. Yeah, maybe. You're talking, he's talking about, you're ta he's talking about David. You're talking about Jesus. Well, I, I'm talking about David, oh. about David too. Oh, okay. That, that's who I was talking about. Okay, I thought you were talking about Jesus. Well, it, he also had a great teacher. <laughs> and a great father. Yeah. Many, many people, certainly most Christians, recognize that God has the ability and the plan to judge us someday. But do they recognize that God himself is on trial? We, there's more than one trial going on here. Okay. Romans 3, 1 to 4. I have, not I have, have, have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much, indeed, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does that mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you're being tried. And the you is who? Yeah. I, I grew up not understanding that, that they were talking about Jesus, God. Yeah. Notice that the question in Romans 3 about God is not about how he saves us. And many of you are aware, I'm sure, that many translations, Bible scholars doing translations, they don't think this could be really talking about God's righteousness. I mean, who has any questions about God's righteousness? Well, the NIV on verse 4 says just the opposite of what verse 4 says here. Yeah. 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 May, so, you, may you prevail in your judging. Yeah. Something to, I mean, yeah. to that effect. Yeah, something yes, like no, that. It's, it's you. God has a... 
I mean, they, they, they don't understand the great controversy. Yeah. So how, how else can you, you know, it must be just something that God is doing. It's not, it can be something that actually affects God. There is no there is no religion out there that understands it the, except yeah. for Seventh Day Adventists and the help of Paul and and uh, Ellen White yeah. is, is, is what. And so you asked, has anyone questioned whether God is righteous? Yes. Yes. The devil did in Genesis two, three, two and three. Yeah. Notice that the question Romans she about God is not how He saves us because that's what a lot of people think. The question is how is God going to save us? but rather about his own righteousness in light of the accusations by Satan in the great controversy. Okay, where are we? God's, God's presence is highlighted by depicting God as reaching as far as hell, Sheol or grave, and darkness, places not typically depicted as where God dwells. His presence also is depicted as taking the wings of the morning, East. That's the east, yeah. To reach the uttermost parts of the sea, uh, meaning west, apparently. Yeah. What these images convey is the truth that there is no place in the universe where we can be out of God's reach. Now, let me explain that for a moment. If you live in Palestine, you think about one side of you is the mountains, the Jordan River, and then mountains. The other side of you is what? The sea. Mediterranean. Mediterranean. So the west is what? The sea. That's the way it was to them. Okay. Now, now they hit those that say well, from the river to the sea. Yeah. They want to eliminate all Jews. Yeah. And they have a God that it rewards <laughs> for doing jihad. And <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I when when I when I think about the war the war that's going on right now, and I think about the background way back and the Iranians. So, they used to tell re basically kids when they back in the days when Iran was fighting against Iraq. This was years ago now. They used to tell young bo young men, young boys, basically, give them a rifle, give them a little bit of training and say, go out there. If you get killed, you will get 49 virgins to live with in heaven. I thought it was 70 or 72. Is it? Well, the number I had was 49. Okay. okay well, it <laughs> doesn't really matter. <laughs> it was like a small I mean, snowball. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you really believe that. Well, and both sides, both sides talk about the, the others as if they're dogs and swine. Mm -hmm. I mean, how in the world can you have a harmony in, in a yeah. state of atonement with, with a paradigm like okay. that. Okay, Duane, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Though God is not part of the universe, as some believe, he is close to it all, having not only created it, but sustaining it as well. Okay. We, of course, recognize that God could communicate with Jonah even in the belly of the giant fish. And you, I'm sure you all heard my story about the little girl standing. She went to Sunday school and she was given a little paper with a picture of Jonah and the whale. She's standing in the corner waiting for her mother to pick her up after Sunday school. And a guy comes along and he says, little girl, what does that picture talk about? So she says, oh, it tells about how Jonah was in the whale's tummy and he came out and so forth like this. And he says, do you really believe that story? Oh yes, I believe that story. Well. What do you think Jonah was thinking when he was down there in the belly of the whale? And the little girl looked puzzled for a moment. He says, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And the man says, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And the little girl, smarter than she actually realized, I think, was, said, then you can ask him. Of <laughs> <laughs> that story. <laughs> uh, I think it's that someplace in Jonah that uh, the belly, the uh, the fish, heard, heard or listened to uh, the, the yeah, God, well, he, Lord. It tells him to. He, he God told the, the fish to vomit him out. Him, yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. Talk about listening. <laughs> the, the most important commandment, which command, is uh, to listen. Hear, O Israel, and even the fish hear. <laughs> so now, listen and obey. Uh huh. 
And listen and obey. Yeah. Well, listen. <laughs> it, 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 obey is, is not... Well, it bombed, he bonded him out on the ground. That's, That's right. obeying. Yeah. Yeah. But the question then comes, what can or what does God do for us in our situation in 2023 or 2024 or whatever in this, this generation? Remember that God's diagnosis of our problems is 100% accurate 100% of the time. Just imagine having a doctor who is that good. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with the fact that God knows everything about you, even your darkest secrets? The gospel is all about knowing the truth about God. If we understand how much he loves us and cares about us, how could we be afraid? Look at Psalm 121 to see how the psalmist regarded God's care for his day-by-day -day activities. From the Good News Bible, I look to the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And it won't come from the mountains where no. they... Where they uh, That's where the fertility cult yeah. services were going on. Yeah. He will not let you fall. Your protector is always awake. The protector of Israel never dozes or sleeps. The Lord will guard you. He is by your side to protect you. The sun will not hurt you during the day, nor the moon during the night. The Lord will protect you from all danger. He will keep you safe. He will protect you as you come and go, now and forever. Good News Bible. Okay. So the question then comes, what if you are destroyed, in, let's say, in an accident? Has God not protected you? If you're one of his faithful children, what's he going to do? Raise you. He's going to raise you back to life and plan for you to live forever. Yeah. Repeatedly in the Psalms, we are told that God is with the psalmist. Are we living our lives recognizing the Lord is always with us? There's some examples, lots and lots of verses to support. We just read Psalm 121. Psalm 121 makes it clear that God will not allow even our feet to be moved off the path. Almighty God keeps track of us day and night, 24-7 as we've come to say. He is not only our protector and guardian, but also He provides, he provides shade. Think of the children of Israel following the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Yes, in Exodus 13, 21 and 22. During the day, the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of, the, in a pillar of cloud and showed them the way. And during the night, he went in front of them in, as a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel <laughs> night and day. Wow. I, Think they really did that? Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't... How would you like to have God as your nightlight? Yeah. I mean, and hopefully I, he sustained them too to make, give them yeah. strength. When I read this story and I think about this story, I'm always like, what did parents say to their children? Said, Mommy, Daddy, what, what, what is that thing up there? What did they say? It's God. Maybe Looks like they a, didn't have flashlights. And they and, and they and maybe it's cold out there too. Yeah. So maybe that's yeah. what it was better than traveling. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah. It gets cold in the desert even in summer. Yeah. The pillar of cloud was always in front of the people during the day, and the pillar of fire at night. Wow. And in many places in Psalms, we are described as being protected by God's right hand. What does that mean? Well, the right hand is considered to be the stronger hand, the hand of action. Psalm 74, 11, and Psalms 89, 13. In light of God's promises, what are some practical ways that we can understand and comprehend and experience God's reality? Do we need to cooperate with God in order for all these things to happen? David talked with God as if they were just having a discussion. 2 Samuel 2, 1 and 2, we'll look at that in just a second. Could we have a similar relationship David had no questions about God's presence and activity at that point in time in his life. Myra? 2 Samuel 2, verses 1 and 2. After this, David said to the Lord, Shall I go and take control of, of one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord answered. Which one? David asked. Hebron. 
the Lord said. So David went to Hebron, taking with him two of his wives. <laughs> okay, just go ahead. Just two of them. Just two of them. The others he left behind. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Hinoam. Encumbered. Yeah. I'm not going to try to say the names here. Hinoam. Um, who was... Uh, Ahinoam, who was from Jezreel, and Abigail, and Nabal's widow, who was from Carmel. Okay. Okay. So, did, they, did God say anything to, to him about his wives? Yeah, go ahead over there and take charge. You, you can be the king of that place. But Lord, what about my two? <laughs> no. Was this after they had conquered these towns or? Uh, well, no, this was after, right after Saul was dead. Oh, oh, oh. And so the question is, David said, okay, God, you told me that I was going to be the king. Do I just march out there and say, here I am, I'm the king? And David says, no, take charge. Hebron was the, sort of the capital of Judah at that point in time. Okay. So he would say, you know, that's your territory. Take charge of that first. Okay. Just two of his wives, though. So. Yeah. Did he have other wives at that point in time? The two that we knew about from that time. Yeah. Not Just two of the ones that we know about from that time. Do, do we know about more? Yes. At that time? Yes. The first, his first wife was Saul's daughter. She's not mentioned here. Oh. Was she still there or had she left already? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you. Oh, my. Many of the psalmists wrote psalms... Heaven will be interesting. <laughs> yes, it will. Many of the psalms who wrote... Many of the psalmists wrote psalms because for one reason or another, they were in trouble. A great psalm about protection is Psalm 91. Could have been because they had too many wives. Yes. Psalms 91, verses 1 to 7. Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, can say to him, you are my defender and protector. You are my God and you I trust. He will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect you and defend you. You need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or the plagues that strike in the dark or the evils that kill daylight kill in daylight. A thousand may fall dead beside you, ten thousand all around you, but you will not be harmed. And I have to tell you a very quick story. The very first young lady that I dated for any period of time, back in college days, grew up in China. Her parents were missionaries to China. And they were there before the communist takeover. And they escaped from China just ahead of the communist horde that were coming after them. And one night, they, they, they were rushing down a road, and someone said, well, there's a safe place for you to stay here. So they went and slept in this house. They woke up the next morning, and they found out that the back part of that house was full of ammunition. If anything had hit that, they would have been just powder. Oh my goodness. And you can imagine how she feels about this, <laughs> about this, this psalm. Mm -hmm. There are many stories of Adventist missionaries protected from evil, even bombing raids by enemies. We need to remember that faith or trust, as it is sometimes called, is a deliberate choice, acknowledging God's lordship over our lives in all circumstances. Because our lives are fairly easy and trouble-free, do, do we not need trust in God? How about that? Think of the life of David and all the battles he fought. Was it easier, easier for him to put his trust in God? If you go out and spend your days with the sword, killing people so they don't kill you, do you have a sense of God's protection? I don't think we have any idea. Just driving on the freeway is... Wow. I think they need a little lot. less ease. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, so it was, hard, it was hard for us to imagine what it would be like to live a life of frequent wars fought on a hand-to-hand -hand basis. One would never know for sure whether he would be alive the next day. When Jesus was on the earth, he mourned the rejection that he experienced in Jerusalem. 
Him, I think that's yours. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone the messenger. God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms round all your people, just as hen gathers her chicks under the, her wings, but you would not let me. Mm. This Bible. That's not a whole lot different than my God, my God, why, or Elohim, Elohim, why have you for, abandoned me or forsaken me? That's basically what he's saying there. Well, he's... So he came for the purpose of educating his children. Yeah. And they, right there, it says, they, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone the messengers. Yeah. They chose to move away from God. He hadn't chose really to move away from God. There's a little bit of difference. We are told that we will be protected like a chick under its mother's wings. And elsewhere in the Psalms, it talks about a, an eagle with its young. Have you ever had a chance to watch an eagle carry his young up and drop it? while the young are trying to learn how to fly and the eagle flies down and just almost at the last moment he, he flies under the young one and the young one grabs him and up he goes again and dumps him off. I see uh, blackbirds drop nuts on the road <laughs> but I've never seen them drop their babies. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's eagles that yeah, I know, I've never yeah. seen that. I've only that, seen so. that in documentaries, not in person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we may not feel like we are in a physical battle or physical war at the present time. However, we must never forget that we are in the midst of the final battles of the greatest war of all times, the great controversy over the character and government of God. The devil will do everything that he can to prevent us from joining God's army. So what kind of methods is he using to the most effectively in our day? Distraction. Yeah, so many distractions. Hmm. We should not need anyone to remind us of the constant care and perfect protection that God provided for the children of Israel wandering those 40 years in the wilderness. Notice these words from Paul about their experience. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed slavery through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses, all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ, Christ himself. himself. Does that apply to the cloud and the fire and the, the sky as well? That's what it says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did the children of Israel recognize that God was actively caring for each one of them? Most or of them they, not. Huh? Most of them not. Probably not. Anyway, it brings, these things always bring stories to my mind. I don't have time. That experience was described also by the psalmist in Psalm 114. Dwayne, I think that's yours. When the people of Israel left Egypt, when Jacob's descendants left that foreign land, Judah became the Lord's holy people. Israel became his own possession. The Red Sea looked and ran away. <laughs> That's interesting words, huh? Yeah. The River Jordan stopped flowing. The mountains skipped like goats. The hills jumped about like lambs. What happened, see, to make you run away? And you, O oh Jordan, why did you stop flowing? You mountains, why did you skip like goats? You hills, why did you jump about like lambs? Tremble, earth, at the Lord's coming, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who changes rocks into pools of water and solid cliffs into flowing springs. Do you think the mountains talking or jumping around like lambs? This is a very prevalent earthquake area. I think they're talking about earthquakes there? Maybe. Maybe. Bible students recognize that the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt was repeatedly referred to by later Bible writers in order to encourage the children of Israel. I think we're going to have a reference to it a little bit later, but in fact, I'll just, I'll just wait. I'll describe it in a moment because I think I'm pretty sure we're going to have it here in a moment. Um, God was able to protect them during the plagues on Egypt, 
to carry them through the Red Sea, to protect them from the Egyptian army, to give them food and water during the, their time in the Red Desert, to help them cross the Jordan River and to fight for them in places like Jericho. Could those kinds of experiences be true about us as well? In our day, the Jordan River is not much more than a small stream because so much water has taken out of it for irrigation, drinking water, etc. However, when Joshua and the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, it was in flood stage. And I, well, we quote, Gordon? Joshua 3, 14 through 17. It was harvest time and the river was in flood. Now, can I interrupt for a second? I have a picture at home. I, maybe I should have brought it so we could look at it here. A picture of home taken in the early 1930s with the Jordan River in flood stage. It almost filled up that whole valley. Mm. So go ahead and read and we'll see what happens in a moment. As soon as the priests stepped into the river, the water stopped flowing and piled up far upstream at Adam, the city beside Zarathan. There is an actual place there known as Adam. The flow downstream to the Dead Sea was completely cut off and the people were able to cross over, on, over near Jericho. While the people walked across on ground, the priest carrying the Lord's covenant box stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until all the people had crossed over. Good news Bible. Okay. Imagine the people of Jericho. I want you to think about this now. Imagine the people of Jericho feeling quite comfortable because they knew nobody could cross the Jordan River in flood stage. And then suddenly there were the children of Israel on their very doorstep. I mean, you'd have a hard time standing up. Your knees would be knocking together, right? From the New Testament, we have a very obvious example, the power of God to protect us from the elements, even from fierce storms. Yes. Myra? Always a favorite story. Matthew yes. 8, 23 to 27. Jesus got into the boat and his disciples went with him. Suddenly a fierce storm hit the lake and the boat was in danger of sinking. But Jesus was asleep. The disciples went to him and woke him up. Save us, Lord. They said, we are about to die. Now I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Who's out there trying to maybe paddle the boat or whatever like that? These are lifetime fishermen. Yes. So now they're asking the carpenter <laughs> to get them out. I have to chuckle every time I think about that. Okay, go well, ahead. If you've ever been in Lake Powell, you know <laughs> what those storms are like when they pop up. And yeah. You know, I'm not guys that are experienced. I, I suspect that this storm was not a natural storm. I'm sure this yes. was the devil's attempt to wipe out Jesus and the, all the disciples. He was sleeping out on the water then. Yeah. But he, he spoke to the wind, just like he did in Genesis 1. Yeah. Speaks yeah. to the... Go ahead. The devil yes. thought, I can wipe out the whole Christian church before it gets started. Exactly. I was thinking that, yes. Jesus answered, why are you so frightened? how little faith you have. <laughs> then he got up and ordered the winds and the waves to stop, and there was a great calm. Everyone was amazed. What kind of a man is this, they said. Even the winds and the waves obey him. I mean, just, it just bowls my... Oh. Those fishermen were still learning. Just this morning, I happened to see a thing on the internet of a cruise ship that was in a huge storm. The waves that came were almost as high as, this, as, the, as the cruise ship. And think about this. Just whoosh, It's all calm. Anyway, what are the greatest spiritual dangers that we face today? God's presence is described as being in the sanctuary or on the hill of Zion, and there's many texts. And so they, the Jews regard that as what? Their capital, their headquarters, right? So if you've got God at the headquarters, you got it made, right? At Seventh-day Adventists, when we talk about the sanctuary, we often think of the final judgment scenes depicted in Zechariah 3 and Daniel 7. We read those last week. But in the Psalms, God's sanctuary was regarded as a place of safety where one could hide in his presence. 
Jim? Psalms 84, 4. How happy are those who live in your temple, always singing praise to you. Good news Bible. That doesn't fit with the typical Jewish understanding who was allowed to go inside the temple. Only the priests, right? If you believe that God will protect you in his sanctuary, who could possibly cause you any trouble? And even if trouble has come in this world, and perchance we might even die, we know that God has a plan for us to live on forever. We can never live lives good enough to, ma to merit a place in God's sanctuary, but his loving kindness and undeserved forgiveness for us welcomes us into that environment. The experience of Jacob, as he prepared to face his brother Esau, is referred to in several places as being familiar to the struggle that the people live, living in the final days of this earth's history will experience. What do we call it? Time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, there's a fairly lengthy section here. Uh, Duane, I'm gonna ask you to read the first paragraph, and then we'll ask Gordon to read the next paragraph and so forth. From the writings of Ellen White, had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God could not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. Hold on, wait, wait. God could not have heard his prayer? Had him not. Had not Jacob previously yeah. repented. Yeah. So if oh. Jacob hadn't had an experience with God before, I, God would not be allowed, quote unquote, to preserve him. Who's not going to allow him? The devil. Okay, so this is a great controversy. This is a great controversy. This is a great controversy. Center stage. Stage, yes. Go ahead. So, in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Hmm. The next Pardon? paragraph, Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life, but the Lord shows in his dealing with Jacob that he can in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. Now I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. You know how this is sort of traditionally understood. Yeah. If you I was, have an unconfessed I was sin, taught God can't do it. As a child, if, yeah. if you don't kneel down beside your bed and ask forgiveness for all your sins every night, there's going to be something still left on the records. If those, those sins don't get wiped out, if you are in... Out, you'll be wiped out. Yeah, exactly. You're in trouble. The more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, ooh, 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 ooh. the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more certain the triumph of the great adversary. So the biggest challenge is for people, what, what kind of people? Those in honorable, honorable positions. positions. Oh boy. We don't know any of those, do we? <laughs> Next paragraph. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have betrayed, been betrayed into sin, but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught the servant, his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus, it will be to those who live in the last days. As Let me danger. interrupt for a second. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I really want us to understand this. Okay, what was, what was Jacob's great sin? Thinking he could do it himself. Well, but back, look at the rest, his earlier in his life. Well, wasn't well it his... he could trick his father. Well, he, he accepted his mother's guidance. Is that a sin? 
Well, if she gives you bad guidance. <laughs> <laughs> is that the sin that God is talking about here? No. What do you think it is? Is it trying to trying to Relying sort of on self? Yes. Well, what did he try to do? He tricked. He he, he tried to buy his brother's birthright. I so that was a part of it. We thought we could hide from God. This is, well, he thought he could hide this. Well, I, I mean, I'm just not sure I have all the full answers. I just think that there's, we need to ask questions about these kinds of things. Because the question then, of course, as follows is, how does that situation apply to us? As we approach the end of time. Well, he, he, was, he was weak in the sense that, well, he's a grown man, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Do you know how old he was before he got married? More than 70. Well, I didn't know he was that old. <laughs> what? I didn't know he was that old. Careful. But, <laughs> but, well, yeah, careful. <laughs> well, and that but, can be, but, actually, God gives us information, enough information in, in the book of Genesis. You've got to work around a little bit, but you can calculate that he was over 70 before he married. Well, we know that they were, I mean, his brother was uh, already a capable... Warrior and all that. Yes. Yeah. So he, he, did, he did this by fraud, and he, he listened, like Dr. Peterson said, to his, his mother. Mm-hmm. He, that was that was bad advice, and Abraham did something very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does that tell us about God? God is far more gracious than people think He is, isn't He? Yes. Yeah. But, but, he understands. But, oh, go ahead. No, well, I was just, but but he didn't forget. No. And, and I, I guess I guess he kept pursuing him knowing that he had soul work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what God knew, what was inside of Jacob, he understood what was going on in his mind after he'd been through all those incredible experiences. Now he's running from his life from one enemy and now he's about to be attacked by another enemy. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Thus, uh, God thus taught his servant that the divine power and grace alone could not give him the blessing he craved. Could give him the blessing he Could give him, yes. Thus it will be, to, will be with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them and despair seizes, seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely on the merits of atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves, and that's the part that we all have to learn. Yeah. In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. And that can clearly be misunderstood, but read on. Yeah. None, will, none will ever perish while they do this. The long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. Listen to those words. Let's read them again. Yeah. None will ever perish while they do this. The long black catalog of our delinquencies, that would be our sins, what happens to it? Is before the eye of God. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. forgotten. There's nothing wrong with God's memory. So why are we safe? He says, I choose not to think about your sins. But he who listened to the cries of his servants of old will hear, hear, will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised and he will fulfill his word. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. That's an interesting comment. His experience testifies to the power of importunate prayer. It is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer of unyielding faith. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ 
or to the individual Krishna are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Those who are will, unwilling to forsake every sin and to seek earnestly for God's blessing will not obtain it. But all who will lay hold of God's promises, as did Jacob, and be as earnest and persevering as he was, will succeed as he succeeded. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Patriarchs and Prophets 2, 1 to 203. So it's not saying that we, I mean, it, it goes back around here saying that Jacob prevailed because he, was, he persevered and was determined, but he was determined in doing what was right mm -hmm. at this point, rather than doing what he had been doing before. Yeah. All those other things. All, all those, those other, other times. <laughs> all those other things, yeah. Well, the story of Jacob's struggle beside the Jabbok River poses one very challenging question. Who was Jacob wrestling against on that night of struggle? The Bible suggests and Ellen White confirms that it was Jesus. Jesus Christ wrestling with Jacob. Why would Jesus do something like that? He wouldn't. He was a man. No, that's not what the Bible says. It's not what Ellen White says. That's the says. way it's translated, and Ellen White wasn't all that informed there. Okay, it was an read. Elohim. It was a type of Elohim, and the uh, Old read. Testament is so messed up on that. Read. That's uh, Anyway, go ahead and read what it says there. God will do great things for those who trust him. The reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 493. After reading Psalms like Psalm 91 and 121, do you sometimes feel like the experiences of the psalmist do not match your experience in everyday life? Is it harder to trust God when things are going poorly or when things are going well? Is it a greater temptation to forget God when things are going smoothly? Is, it more trust, is more trust developed when we go through difficult experiences and we see how God has preserved us? It should be obvious by now that... The Psalter Wayne? is a book of prayer. Whatever the subject, whether praise, lament, the messianic hope, the kingdom of God or redemption history, the psalmist manifest strong confidence in the Lord, no matter what their needs or circumstances, they trust that the Creator will abide with them. Okay, from our Bible study guide. Let us try to summarize some of the important points of this lesson. God hears us. In the Bible study guide, it says the psalmist constantly pleads with the Lord to hear him. Several Psalms start with a cry, Yahweh, cry for Yahweh to listen. Now, the, why is that necessary? I mean, if we believe that God hears us all the time, he hears us, everything is going on, he even knows what's going on in our minds. Because they were probably straying off some distance Does away this, and this yeah. and now they're begging. Remember it says they don't pray for these people, look what they're doing, they're mm -hmm. and so forth, you know. <laughs> trying to get their attention. So is this is this to say that we need to do this because we need to remind ourselves who who it is we're dealing with? It's a poetic way of saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. So they're References like Psalms 4 1, Psalms 13 3, Psalm 17 1, and there were many others. In such songs, the psalmist cries out to God, his heart filled with grief O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. In their prayers, the psalmists insist on being heard, and there are probably 10 references. They cry out, 
in the assurance that God hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Okay, now when we were talking about Jacob, we talked about his importunate prayers. What does that mean? We don't know what importunate means? No. It means you keep asking. You don't give up. You keep asking. So Jacob, Jacob had been away from his brother and away from his mother and father for 20 years. Now he's going back. Did he spend those 20 years asking God to forgive him? He didn't send an email back home to say, Mother, forgive me, and Brother, forgive me. Actually, his mother was dead by then, wasn't mm -hmm. she? Well, at least by the time he returned home. Yeah. So, Sometimes... Continuing. Yeah. Sometimes the writers of the Psalms affirm that God has heard their complaints and needs. Remembering God's answers to prayer in the past strengthens the psalmist in the assurance that he will answer them now and in the future. In full confidence of a uh, divine response, the psalmists state repeatedly that the Lord will answer their prayers. They assure us that God is available to hear our prayers morning, noon, and night. Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Okay, God cares for us. Bible Study Guide says, in the book of Psalms, the Lord is depicted as a powerful king ready to fight for his people. At the same time, he is presented as a kind and loving God who cares for those who believe in him. Various images are used to portray God's tender care. God is depicted as a tender shepherd taking care of his defenseless sheep, as in Psalms 23. As our shepherd, he provides everything for them, rest, food, water, comfort, guidance with many of the verses from Psalms 23, his presence in the valley of the shadow of death, abundance and goodness and mercy. Many okay, texts. so Psalms 23, we're about to run out of time, but look at that. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and he leads me into quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you're with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. Wow. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life and your house will be my home as long as I live. Can you think of an experience that affected you or a good friend personally and which God seemed to step in and care for you? I have to tell you a personal story. I think we'll have time for it. Many years ago in the country of Tanzania, before cars were fitted with seat belts, my two children, Todd and Patrice, were riding in our Volkswagen Combi. Volkswagen Combis have facilities in them for cooking and preparing food. It was time for us to have our evening meal, but as my wife was preparing a meal in the back and I was driving, the children were sticking their heads out the window, just enjoying the cool air blowing past. Now, we're driving a European model car, so I'm driving on the left, I mean, like an American side, I, so I'm sitting on the left-hand side in the driver's position, but Tanzania drives on the other side of the road. So I'm clear at the edge of the road, driving over here, like my kids are over here sticking their heads out the window in the middle of the road. I mean, that's, they were there facing the middle of the road. The road was narrow and we were driving a vehicle designed for Europe in which I sat on the left side of the front driver's position. We were driving in a left-hand drive country. So when my wife told the children to please get out of her way while she prepared a meal, uh, they, were, they moved to the front seat beside me and stuck their heads out the window on what should have been the driver's side of the vehicle. As I was coming down a long hill, I could see a truck coming toward us in the opposite direction on this narrow road. At the bottom of the hill, there was an even narrower bridge. The truck was blinking his lights as it came down the hill. I was closer to the bridge, and I did not realize that the truck was t driving as fast as I was, as it was. I assumed the, tr the truck would slow down a little bit and that I would be able to get to cross the narrow bridge. Um, 
but apparently the driver felt that by blinking his lights, I would just stop or slow way down and get out of his way. And he didn't bother to move over. I mean, just before we reached the place where the narrow bridge was located, my wife called our two children to come to the back to get ready to eat. As I approached the narrow bridge, just as that happened, I should add, I realized that the truck driver had no intention of slowing down and he had no intention of moving over. As quickly as I could, I got across the bridge. I immediately swerved to the left since we were in a left side drive country. Even so, the truck probably driving 60 miles per hour came so close to us that it destroyed our rear view mirror on that side of the vehicle. If the children had still been there, they would both have been decapitated. Would you consider that an answer to prayer, a miracle? In the Hebrew language, there are not many adjectives. So the psalmists often use comparisons to describe what they were talking about. When talking about God as a shelter, he's called a shelter, a tower, a defender, a strong fortress, a protector, and a shield. He is described as the strength, a rock, a fortress, and a stronghold. God also is our defender in a legal sense. Jim, you're the legal, legal guy. Can you take this one on? God is our vindicator, our advocate, and our champion. The imagery is obviously drawn from the legal realm and is primarily employed in the context of the widow and the fatherless. The book of Job and Psalms depict the Lord as defender of widows and orphans, Psalm 68, 5. But God does not always act immediately to prevent problems. On some occasions, he is described as a deliverer, he is described in that term four times in the book of Psalms alone. So God definitely is our shield. He wants to defend us from sin, its consequences, anxieties, and problems that surround us in the world. As we think about all the comments and references in this lesson, we should spend time meditating on the imagery and figures used in the Psalms. Try to imagine yourself in the position in which the psalmist found themselves and I think about David, particularly, out there with his sword. I mean, how many times did he have experiences he, he should have died? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we read and try to re reimagine in our minds these experiences from an old, from old times, many, many years ago, 3,000 years ago, help us to realize that these truths still are, are still true in our day. Help us to depend upon you, to rely upon you, to trust in you always is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.